Well, good morning. I'm really excited to continue this series, Dear Church, where we're diving into 1 Corinthians, taking a look at this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And today we're going to be in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. And this week as I was preparing, uh, this passage really reminded me of the old computer game Minesweeper. You guys know what I'm talking about? All right, yeah, youngins, this was it, okay? <laughs> This is what was up, right? We clicked random boxes on the screen. There was a strategy. I don't know what it was, okay? And you tried to not land on a mine and blow yourself up. Um, and, uh, and this week, as I was looking at this passage, it reminded me of that, okay? Uh, that this section that Paul writes here is a little bit of a minefield for us. Um, it, it can blow us up if we're not careful. Uh, because this is a section of scripture that, like all scripture, is God-breathed. It is true. It is good for us, right? It, it, it is valuable to us. But it is so countercultural to our world today that it's easy for us to take it out of context and misunderstand what we're reading and misinterpret what we're reading and for it to blow up our relationships, for it to blow up our faith, for it to, to blow up so many things in our lives. And so uh, instead of just uh, avoiding the field entirely and not learning how to navigate the minefield, we're going to work through this together today. Um, and so before we start reading, I need to ask you guys to do something for me, okay? I need you to trust that we're going to work through this passage <laughs> and not hear something that you don't like and tune me out the rest of the morning, Okay. All right, like stay with me. We're going we're gonna to work through this because it's an important passage for us. And so uh, without any further ado, now that you're all so excited, um, let's, uh, let's start reading chapter 11, verse 1, okay? And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and, and that you are following the teachings I passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a, a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping. For man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory. And woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it is disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. Aren't you so glad you came to church today? <laughs> Like, just let's, let's roll, right? I know, last week we talked about politics a little bit. I did not get enough angry emails. And so here we are, I guess. I don't know. Oh, man. The head of man is Christ and the head of woman is man is enough to just, like, step on a bomb, right? Like, we're... We're there already. Um, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that dynamic there and, and, and what we learn about from that and all of that. I need you to hang tight with me. I want to talk about this head covering thing real quick and, and where this comes from and, and, and why do we not really care that none of you ladies are covering your heads right now, um, right? Where's this? What is this? Why would we care? 
Um, why does Paul care? What's happening here? Uh, well, when we dive into Scripture, when we try to understand the meaning of Scripture, we've talked about this a lot, and a, and a crucial principle for us is that context determines meaning, right? Context determines meaning. The context of what's being said, who is saying it, who they're saying it to, what's happening around them, like all of those things help us understand the meaning of these passages as we read them. And so there, there's a lot of context that's happening here in Corinth. It is common for women throughout this ancient world to cover their heads. It, it is seen as a, a sign of modesty, all right? And modesty is great. Modesty is awesome. Um, modesty is also a moving target. It is. It's culturally driven in so many ways. It is a moving target. As we look through history, that is the case. But also, even if we look at, took a snapshot of our world today, there are certain places in our world where modesty is one thing and certain places where it is another, right? There are still environments in our world where a woman not having her head covered it is seen as immodest. And yet, if we were to go to the, the jungles, the, the Amazon rainforest, the, the way that the women are dressed there is not seen as immodest, and they're wearing a lot less clothing, right? And there's so much culturally driven about modesty. And so we have to recognize that historically, culturally, this is a, a moving target. Um, it, it's not actually about how much skin is shown. It, it's a heart issue. And in their day, the, the women would have covered their heads. That's what was acceptable culturally for them. In Corinth, uh, there were women who would walk around without their heads covered, um, and they were the prostitutes. That's who would do that. It was a sign to all of the men that you were available. And I don't just mean unmarried. Available, right? And so that this way of dressing communicated something. It communicated something to the men that you were available. And so to come into church dressed that way, to get up and pray and prophesy in the church dressed that way was not okay. It was not modest. And so in this, Paul is talking about that. He's like, look, I know you have freedom in Jesus. Like, I'm real thankful you have freedom in Jesus, but, but like, this is taking it too far. This is stepping outside the bounds of culturally what's seen as modesty. And so we recognize that while today we, women don't cover their heads as a sign of modesty in our culture here in Cape Coral, Florida, um, it's still important that women would obs observe modesty and, and dress in a way that, that honors uh, themselves as well as other people, right? The culture is so different. It's so hard for us sometimes when we read some of these ancient things where, where, where we're trying to understand what is Paul saying here and how do we apply it to our everyday lives and what do we do with this? And, and, and so we have to recognize that, that this, this culture and understanding it helps inform how we act here. The, 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 even the, the culture of identity was so different in the ancient world. Your identity was so formed and structured by your place within your family. That was a huge part of it, huge part of their identity. And, th and that remained for a long, long time. That's why when we watch movies where there's knights and stuff in the right in medieval times and you're watching that and somebody introduces themselves, right? I am so-and-so, son of so-and-so, house of whatever, right? Because where they fit within their family was a huge part of their identity, we have a much more uh, individualistic identity uh, culture today, where each of us are defined by ourselves in so many ways. And, and, and where this plays out is really even in the language. The words men and women here in Greek could just as easily be translated husband and wife. In fact, they go back and forth the way they translate it within passages, within uh, the scriptures from book to book. It, 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 these are words that are seen both ways. To say man is to say husband. To say husband is to say man. Because in their culture, you were a son until you were a husband. You were a daughter until you were a wife. Where you fit within your family unit drove so much of your identity. And so in, in these passages, as we're talking about these things, this is not just all men and all women. There's a family dynamic at play here. A family dynamic within the church as well as family dynamics at home. 
that, that are at play within the language. And, and so uh, why does that matter? <laughs> uh, because we read verses like this, uh, verse 3 here. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And just the, the six words there, the head of woman is man, is enough for some of us to just like throw our chair across the room and leave. Um, and I get that, okay? I understand that this is, this is one of those things that we, we have to work through this minefield together, okay? Because otherwise, we start to draw conclusions out of context about who Paul is, about who God is, about who Christians are, about who the church is, and we draw all of these conclusions without fully understanding what he's saying here because we, we hear about the head and we lose it. We get frustrated about it. When the reality is a, a beautiful picture of relationship that we see in the New Testament. And, and it really is a, a picture of relationship that helps us live out the character of Jesus. I mean, one of the things that I want to make sure that we note here is that headship does not mean superiority. It just doesn't. Headship does not mean superiority. Does not mean more important. Does not mean more valuable. Does not, does not mean a more significant part of the team even. It does not mean superiority. In this very passage, we read that the head of Christ is God. That, that is, the head of the, the Son is the Father. The head of Jesus is, is God the Father. That's what we're reading there. And yet, we, we know that they are, are both called God in the New Testament. We know from Matthew 28 that, that all authority has been given to Jesus, right? He tells his disciples this before ascending to heaven, and that, that same truth, it actually goes all the way back uh, to, to the prophets. We, we read in, in Daniel chapter 7, check this out, I, I love this. As my vision continued that night, I, I saw something like a, a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one, the ancient one here is, is God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world. So that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. And in this prophecy, we have, we have two beings at play here, it seems. Although we now know that, it, that it's two parts of the Trinity that we're, we're seeing. We have the, the ancient one, God the Father. And then the, this, this other person shows up on the scene. This son of man. And then if you've read any of the Gospels before, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, if you've ever read those, you, you, you read Jesus over and over again calling himself this weird title that doesn't make any sense out of context, right? He calls himself over and over again, what? The son of? We really got to work on the call and response thing. We got to. <laughs> so first service struggled too. So like you're not alone, all right? This is me. I failed, all right? But the son of? All right, great job. Drastic improvement. I love it. The son of man. That, that there is this, this dynamic there where God is on the scene and then somebody arrives with authority, power, sovereignty over all. This is really a, a confusing uh, prophecy for, for years and years and years, right? And then Jesus shows up and starts walking around telling the religious leaders, hey, I'm the one who speaks with the, that authority. I'm the one who can speak with equal authority to God, to the Father. And yet, Jesus submits to the Father. And so it doesn't mean more significant, more important, more valuable. It doesn't mean superior here. It is a relationship dynamic at play where one piece of the relationship, one party in the relationship chooses not to not have an opinion. This isn't that, that there will be no opinion, right? But chooses to lovingly trust the other person, 
to choose humility in that way, to lovingly trust them. And that's a hard dynamic for us. But it's not the only dynamic we're, we're talked about in this relationship. The, the Corinthians had spent a year and a half where Paul lived there and taught them about Jesus and the ways of, of God and, and all of these things. And so I think it's safe to assume that they had probably talked about what a, a Christian marriage, a Christian family would look like at some point in that year and a half. And so they, they would have had other conversations to, to pull from to more completely understand what's being talked about here. And we have other conversations to pull from to more completely understand what's being talked about here. Paul wrote other letters, and, and we have them as parts of the New Testament. And so we, we can go to places like Ephesians 5, right, where we kind of get both sides of this dynamic. And, and so we, we read this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, for wives, that means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the, the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. And we have to look at both pieces of this relational dynamic. Because men, we are, are given a, a bold responsibility here, a big one, a heavy responsibility for, for us, not just to love, but to love as Christ loved the church. And then Paul defines that for us. What does it mean to love as Christ loved the church? That he was willing to lay down his life for her. Now look, very few of us men will ever even have an opportunity where it would make sense for us to literally lay down our lives for our spouse. That doesn't happen all the time. And yet, every day we have the opportunity to die to ourselves, to lay our wants and needs to the side, and to love our spouse, to put their needs first. And to die to, to ourselves in that way. And for us to love them as Christ loved the church. And this is a, a beautiful relationship dynamic here. Where both parties, both men and women, are, are invited really to, to live out part of the character of Jesus here. It, it's, it's incredible the way that we're invited into this. But women are, are invited to, to live out the, this, this submission of Jesus. This is something Jesus did. He submitted to the Father. And men, we are invited to, to live out the sacrificial love of Jesus. And through that, this, this teamwork, this mutual desire to love each other well in this way, to, to love each other in a way that lines up with how God created us, how he uniquely wired us up as men and women. We, we are invited into this beautiful relationship that helps us. Not, not only is it beneficial because we get, we get relationship that we were designed for, but, but we get relationship that helps us move closer to, to this image of our Heavenly Father, to living out his character here on earth. And through this, this beautiful thing where, where we get to do this, we get to grow. Now, there are some pitfalls of this. One is that this idea of submission, this idea of putting somebody else's needs ahead of your own, both of these ideas run incredibly countercultural. We don't like them. They don't fit our current culture. We're not comfortable with these ideas. We want to protect ourselves and our own interests. And so we, we start to find excuses to not do this. And it's not hard. We don't have to look very hard to find a good excuse, right? Because it's a relational idea, I, 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 it's cool, I talk for a living. Um, just not well. Um, this relational dynamic, because of that, 
all we have to do is point our finger. I mean, I would if she would. I would if she would. Or I would if he would, right? Absolutely. Absolutely I would. But they're not. And so I don't have to. And, and, and we talk ourselves into this, and it's easy, right? And it even makes sense to us as we're having these discussions to say, like, well, you know, not really my fault. As soon as they do, I will. I'll be in as soon as they demonstrate this consistently for nine years without ever failing a single time, right? Like, <laughs> I'll be in. And yet we know, we know that doesn't apply to other places in our life. Everything in my life, it feels, runs through the filter of parenting young children right now. <laughs> and it, it is so frequent that we are with our kids and we have expectations for our kids and other people don't have wrong expectations, but they have different expectations. Let's just say it that way, okay, of their kids. And we're running into it over and over and over again now, right? Well, they don't have to, <laughs> right? They don't have to stay at the table while they're eating. Why would I do that? That sounds insane, Dad, that I would remain at the table while I eat a, a meal, right? Well, they don't have to come when called. That's not asked of them. And they want to point the finger at somebody else and say, well, they don't have to. And I, as a parent, am like, I don't care that they don't have to, right? Your obedience is not dependent on them. And for us, we need to recognize that this way of loving each other, it, it is not something where we are obeying the other person in the relationship. We're obeying God in this. Right? I love my wife. But the truth is, for me to love her as Christ loved the church, it can't just be about her. It has to be about me obeying my father. And I'm obeying him in this. I'm honoring him in this. And as I honor him, I'm loving her. And that is the relationship dynamic that we are invited into here where our obedience here is not dependent on the other person. Now what that does not mean, I wanna be clear, because we can take anything too far. <laughs> what that does not mean is that if you are in an abusive relationship that you should just remain in that and, well, I, I just have to sit here in this because my obedience isn't dependent on them. God does not want you to remain in an abusive situation, okay? And so I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm really clear about that. So after this, this dynamic is described, this relational dynamic, uh, Paul says a couple other things here in verses four and five that I want to make sure I highlight. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a, a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. So uh, we believe that these are instructions for the way the church is going to worship together. And this is, issue isn't that she's praying and prophesying, it's how she's doing it, right? That she's doing it without this, this head covering. And so we, we get a picture, if you just read these verses, that, that women in the ancient church are praying and prophesying in this gathering, okay? Now, I, I want to talk about what prophesying is really quickly, because I think too often we, we have a, a misconception of what prophesying is. Um, pro prophesying uh, is not like Christian fortune telling. It's not what prophecy is in scripture. Um, sometimes prophets will talk about things that happen in the future because God tells them to do so. But what prophesying really is, is giving God's word to the people of God, right? Or, or I really love the way uh, that Nofel Staten says it here. Praying is speaking to God about people. Prophesying is speaking to people about God. It's giving the words of God to the people of God speaking, proclaiming the word of God. And so we, we get this picture that like, hey, it's wrong for women to do that without their head covered. 
But then we, we turn a couple pages and we're already talking about it. So like, let's just knock it out at this point, right? And we go to chapter 14 and, and we, we read this. Women should be silent during the church meetings. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive just as the law says. If they have any questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. What do I do with that? <laughs> right? I have in one place where he's like, women are speaking. They're both praying and prophesying. Those are speaking things. They're talking. But they shouldn't do that without their head covered. And then I go a couple more chapters and like, don't talk. Right? So what do I do here? We, we, we believe that the, the Bible does not conflict with itself, uh, doesn't contradict itself. We, we believe that the Bible is all true. We certainly believe that Paul would not in one letter contradict himself, right? That in one place he wouldn't say something and then like a couple paragraphs later just say something different. Um, and, and so we are left as followers of Jesus to do our best to understand the context of what's happening here and apply what we read to the church today. And to live in obedience to God's word, whether it fits our culture or not. And, and so in that, we, we, ha we have to, to really start to work it. Okay, this feels like a contradiction. What's happening contextually in both of these places? And, and, and honestly, guys, the church is very divided over this worldwide. There's disagreement about what happens here. And, and I, I, I hate that. My heart breaks for that. Because I, I think that we can read scripture and, and, and understand that we're, we're talking about a culture that, that we are very removed from and we can come to different understandings on it, um, on some of these kinds of passages. And I, I think that we can disagree while not being divided. And that we can disagree and remain in unity. That we can choose to be in unity even in some of these places where, where we're, we're not 100% sure. And so for us, we, we, we have really understood that in this context, what's happening is that in the ancient world, women were treated as second-class citizens. They were treated as property. Uh, they were not allowed to be educated. They weren't allowed to go to the schools. They were educated at home, um, but not in like the cool homeschool way that you educate your kid, okay? Um, they were not educated. And now, for the first time, they are being welcomed into the teachings in these religious gatherings. And guess what? They have a lot of questions, okay? But this is not happening in a healthy way. As they are, are having these questions and thoughts, um, they're just interrupting their husbands on stage to question or challenge them in this setting. And it's disruptive, okay? And so it's not that there is never to be a disagreement. It's not that questions shouldn't be asked. It, it's not any of that. It became incredibly disruptive to the church gathering. And so Paul is seeking order here. He's, he's saying, look, that, that is not helpful. You're not adding value here as you constantly interrupt and there's not able to be a discussion. We, we, we need to not do that. Let's, let's ask questions in a better way, okay? Or let's challenge in a better way. And so what that means in my life is that Abby waits till I get home and then she challenges me. You know, I guess, um, love you, babe. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and so we, we look at that and we say, okay, um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to honor that. Um, we, we also read other things about the roles of women in the church, the roles of men in the church. Uh, in, in both Timothy and Titus, we, we get a description of the, the position of elder within the church. And it is described as a man in both of those places. And yet we, we have no place in the New Testament where, where a woman is given the title of elder. And so here, here at Crosspoint, we, we, we honor that because we're going to obey what Scripture says. We're, we're going to be obedient to Scripture above culture, above what's comfortable, above what we understand. We're going to obey Scripture. And so at Crosspoint, the, the lead pastor and our shepherds, which is just what we call elders, um, those are male roles. Not because we think men are better, not because we think men are more important, but because we are called to obey Scripture regardless of whether or not it's comfortable for us. And this is uncomfortable, okay? 
It was not comfortable to prepare to, to, to teach this this week. This right now is not comfortable for me. All right? This is hard. It's uncomfortable. There are things in, in Scripture that, that, that are difficult for me to comprehend. There are things in Scripture that, that are difficult for me, for me to understand why. There are things in Scripture that, that sometimes on some days when I'm in some moods, I disagree with. But I have to recognize at a certain point, who's God? Me or him? Whose ways are higher, mine or his? Who's the authority here, me or him? And I, I have to choose that I'm going to obey what Scripture says, whether it's comfortable for me or not. And, and so we, we try to walk in obedience to that everywhere we go. That's what we're called to as followers of Jesus. And when we run into teachings like this, when we run into teachings like, like love your enemy, right? I've joked about this over the years, but, but I'm serious, guys. Almost every time I read that passage, I wonder for just a moment if Jesus understands what an enemy even is. Because I'm not, I don't naturally love them. That's what makes them my enemy. And yet I'm called to love them. I read teachings like, like if somebody comes and they take away my coat, I should give them my shirt too. Teachings about how the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Te teachings about this, this selfless serving of Jesus. Te teachings about the ways of God that from a human perspective don't make sense to me. They're difficult. And yet I, I, don't, I don't obey the Bible just because it makes sense. I don't obey the Bible just because I agree with it. I, I obey the Bible because it's the word of God. And because as I do, I grow closer to him. I grow in my understanding of who he is. And so I, I want to share just two quick things with you guys uh, as I wrap up today. These truths, okay? These absolute truths. The first one is that Jesus didn't command us to do things that he himself was unwilling to do. We're not commanded to do things by Jesus that he himself was unwilling to do. He lives out these teachings. And we're called not just to go do these commandments, but to follow him. To follow how he lived his life. And the second thing is this, the commands of Jesus are good for us and for others. In fact, they're what's best for us and for others. And I know this. I know this to be true. And I know it to be true because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. I know it to be true because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. I know that he loves you. I know that he cares about you. I know that he views you as, as worthy and valuable. I know that he, he desires you because he was willing to lay his life on the line for you to pour out his blood for you. So that you could have the, the most important thing in the world, right? What, what Alex talked about, that there would no longer be this division between us and God, that there would no longer be this, this divide anymore, that we could approach the throne of heaven because of Jesus. And so I know Jesus loves me. And I know what love is. It's him being willing to lay his desires to the side, to die for me. And I can walk in faith. I can trust that even when his teachings are difficult, they're what's good. Would you guys pray with me? Father God, I thank you that your word is good. I thank you that, that we have the, the demonstrated love of your son. And that as we examine your teachings, God, as, as we seek to, to live in a way that honors you, to live in a way that helps us grow closer to you, I thank you, Lord, that you've never commanded us to do something that you haven't demonstrated yourself. And Father God, I want to pray that you will bless the marriages of this church. God, that you will help us as men to learn what it looks like to, to love in a way where we are willing to die to ourselves every day. 
And Father, I wanna pray that you will help the, the women in this room to, to learn to, to be that, that helper, that, that teammate, God, to, to learn what it looks like to, to lovingly uh, and out of trust to submit, Lord. And Father, I pray that you will remove the lie, the lie of the enemy, that this is somehow a, a, a warped, old-fashioned teaching and that you will help us to see each day that this is a gift from your love. Father God, I pray all of this in Jesus' name.